What's up, mentors? As entrepreneurs, sometimes we just need a little reminder that every single one of us, no matter how successful we are, no matter where we are in life, has struggled, has got knocked down probably multiple times. I know I have. But it's the ones who get back up, who learn from their mistakes, and who have surrounded themselves with people and support systems to help them get to the next level are the ones that are really going to separate themselves from the entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to the owners, the founders, the successful ones. Because I'm sure, as you've seen on social media, from friends, from being in the industry, there's a big difference between those who are hustling, freelancing, trying to do it, and those who have actually made it. So it's all about resilience. I strongly believe that. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about some of the ways to be resilient, some of the tools that you can have, some of the ways that you can set up your life, your environment, your business, so that when you get knocked down, when you face hard times, because you will, how to get out of it and how to come out on top. To have this conversation, I got a good friend, Kyle Livingston, who has gone through exactly what I'm talking about. He has lost everything. He started with brick and mortar, and now he's at a point like a lot of you listening and a lot of you want to be, where you've learned so much, you've experienced so much, and now it's time to give back, to help others grow to that level. So Kyle, I'm pumped to have you on the episode. Welcome, brother. Jay, what's up, man? I am stoked to be here. What a great introduction, bro. I appreciate you saying that. And man, because I, I can relate. You know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, a lot of the people listening have been through hard times. Maybe they're mm -hmm. going through one right now. And sometimes it's stuff out of your control. Maybe you're relying on a vendor too much. Uh, your business is built around a specific social media platform. Something happens there. There's just so many factors. And if you're not ready, mentally, bank account wise, team wise, it can destroy you. Tell yep. me about a time that you, your business was destroyed. You were destroyed. Oh man. Um, so there was a point where we were on track to do $3 million in revenue that year. And nine months into the year, I was out 200, almost $200,000. And uh, leading up to the, you know, those nine months, it wasn't just financially we were busted. I was emotionally busted. I was physically busted. I ended up in the hospital because I was, had a full-blown like, panic attack, didn't even know what they were. And it was, it was wild, man. So um, yeah, that was definitely one of those seasons where it was just like, oh, is this ever going to end? Right. And I always say for entrepreneurs like, oh, is this right for me? Should I start my own business? If you're emotionally unstable with normal day-to-day -day life and with a day job, entrepreneurship's probably not for you because this shit can be a roller coaster. So I'm <laughs> this sure shit you is a roller coaster, bro. <laughs> it is a roller coaster. It can be. It is. Yeah. So fucking brace yourself and you have to be strong. You have to be mentally strong, mm -hmm. resilient, and you need to, man, it's hard to even explain what the the characteristic is that makes a good entrepreneur that helps them get through this. What would you describe as kind of the, the motivating force that helped you and you, you think helps other successful entrepreneurs work through those times? Because it happens to everyone. Mm, it does. I would say for me that the motivating force changes. And before I jump into the motivating force, like, you know, how do I say this? Everybody goes through it. So you're asking like, what are those characteristics that define this? I've <laughs> never talked to a successful entrepreneur who didn't make it or, or who made it and didn't have the story. We all have the story because that's what takes it. Um, man, as I jump into that, I actually forgot your question. I'm so sorry. You're okay. The dog kind of barked there. I got the girlfriend's dog here with me. Cool. We can just redo that section if you want, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, we'll, we'll just get right back into it. Uh, so the number one, I guess, characteristic of an entrepreneur, what is it that you think defines us, that uh, gives us the ability to be able to get up after something like this happens? I would say it's a reason, like, why are you doing what you're doing? And, and it sounds so cliche, and that, that reason has to be bigger than you, and it changes over time. Man, when I first started in the game, the reason for me was running away from being poor. Like... And everything I did for the first probably seven years of my adult career was about not being poor. Like knowing that when I turned the shower on, water was going to come out. And like, that was the only thing I really gave a shit about was like not having to take a bath in pool water ever again. And I got to a place in life where we got comfortable and that shifted and changed. That shifted and kind of changed into a different reason. And so uh, I actually have today two reasons um, that I do this that get me out of bed because man, the roller coaster happens. Like, I'll be honest, October for me was one of the most difficult and the most pleasurable months I've ever had. We hit some incredible milestones that have been on the goals for five years, 
but emotionally and some other stuff we had going on in our business and in my life, like you're saying earlier, like, dude, it's emotionally taxing. And so the, the you got to go through it in business. And so for me, it's now changed. And so now when I wake up in the morning and I had a really bad day yesterday, maybe we had some bad client experiences, or maybe we didn't close the deals we thought we were going to close or whatever happened. Um, for me, it's twofold. One is what we do with the money. And what we, one is what we do with our services. And not just until this last couple of weeks, I've really solidified, like, what are, what are our services actually impacting and what's the why? And so I'll start with the one that I've, I've had on my heart for the longest, which is what we do with the money. Now, there's only so much money you can spend in lifestyle and real estate and all this stuff. And for some people out there, they're called to give back. For me, I'm called to give back. There are certain things that I want to do, but it's going to require me and my skill sets of making money to do them. And one of them is fighting uh, sex trafficking. And rescuing women and children from from cages, you know, and so that's been on my heart for the longest time. Like, I will never be the guy that goes and kicks the door in, like poof, walking in, kicking the door in. But I'll be the guy that funds the people doing it because, on average, it costs about eighty to eighty five thousand dollars to rescue and rehab an individual. It's a lot of money. And where does it come from? It comes from people like you and me who build businesses and we build these things that we can then support it. But then recently, I was thinking, I was like. <sighs> Like, what does the business actually do from an impact perspective? It's got to make money. We can take the money and you can impact anything. And I was thinking about this the other day and I was like, man, uh, I was actually at a mastermind over in Boise and I, I met up with an old friend that I met a couple years back and him and I were having a conversation and he had his son there and his son was in the mastermind the whole three days. And I started thinking to myself, I'm like, man, like, yeah, guys like him, like the people that I work with, I impact their life. Sure. But then they still grew up with the traumas and the issues and the problems and the mindset issues, blah, 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 that you grew up with. But when you're around somebody who's growth minded and you're being raised by somebody who's growth minded and you impact their life financially and you help them grow in their business and their kids are way more impacted than the, than the parents are. Even though I'm working with the parents, I'm actually impacting the kids. And so for me, like I woke up out of bed 430 on Monday, like let's rock and roll because that vision was close and, and, and hot for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you say that, and I want to piggyback because you said a lot of really, really important things that I agree with. One was kind of your initial motivation for hustling, grinding, and, and doing what you did because entrepreneurship is a lot of work. It's a lot more work than most people think it is, mm -hmm. and it's way harder than working a nine-to-five for a certain period of time. I think there's yeah. the three-to-five period, no weekends, 80-hour weeks, making no money to get to a point where you can finally be comfortable, and usually – that fire comes from running away from pain. I know it was for myself too. I was kind of disregarded at 17 after I was arrested uh, and kind of had a need to prove myself and become somebody different. Uh, was working as a collections agent, hated the shit out of that job. And I'm like, I'm never going to be doing this a day in my life. I'm never going to have to be stuck in a cubicle working for a boss who's going to yell at me every day. So that was me running away from pain. And now, like you mentioned with your mission to fund the end of sex trafficking, which I love, kudos to you. Thanks, I think man. every entrepreneur should get to a point or should aspire to get to a point where that becomes the motivation, not how much you can make, but how much you can give away. Right. And finding a cause that's close to heart. For me, it, personally, it's animals. I think every cause, yeah. no matter what it is, if it's you know, in, in the interest of social justice and making the world a better place, it doesn't matter. No one's gonna judge you for it, but do something good. Yeah. Uh, so love that you said that and the transformation and the motivation changes over time. Beautiful stuff. Thanks, man. Uh, now walk me through, I guess, the journey to get there because you don't have overnight success right away. You don't start giving money away right away. And you told me some uh, a fun story pre-episode for what you actually did uh, yeah. to, to start your entrepreneurial journey. So tell me about that. Well, dude, before I actually share the piece about the the business I was in before this, my entrepreneurial journey started when I honestly, like as, as a kid and as a young teenager, I was probably 12, 13 years old, and uh, I wanted to go to a camp for our church. And I didn't have the money. We grew up uh, in, we were in my, what it felt like below the poverty line. Like, I don't know how much they actually made, but like we were poor, like bills were getting shut off and we couldn't afford to go to this Bible camp. And so my dad was like, hey, if you go knock on the neighbor's doors and maybe they'll let you mow the lawn, um, you know, try that. And so I actually started going around like mowing lawns and washing cars and doing all of that. And then that transitioned into a mobile detailing business at 16. And I was, you know, doing all these gigs as a, as a young kid. Um, but when I was about 13 years old, somewhere around there, I was in, uh, after a weekend of working, I walk into, or I'm in my bedroom counting my money from the weekend, my hall, my weekend hall. My mom walks in, 
She goes, hey, do you, are you counting up your savings? I'm like, no, no, this is just what I made from today and yesterday. And she's like, you literally made more than dad did today. And I knew right then, I was like, oh, this is broken. I can't do this. Whatever he's doing, I don't want to do. Like, I went out and made, like, that's not going to work. And so that got me into um, owning a commercial construction business later on in life. And we would build cell phone towers, you know, those big three, four, 500 foot towers that you have. The guys would go up and climb and we'd either build those or fix those or maintain those. Um, and I had built up three of them, successfully exited them, some with partners, some with not. And, uh, dude, I thought I was on top of the world. Like I'm shocked. I could fit through doors, how big my fucking ego was, dude. And so for me, I'm walking through and like, I thought going into the fourth business, I had $3 million of work literally land in my lap. I thought nothing can touch me. Nothing can go wrong. And we were on track to do just over $3 million that year. And within nine months, dude, I lost almost $200,000 of because I was so far in the weeds of the business and I was unwilling to take a step out and be like, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I actually need some help. Setting my ego aside and saying like, who can help me get out of this rut? I just plowed forward. And, you know, coming from the construction world, um, you know, those things that are stud finders that you help like find a stud on the wall. Oh yeah. People are like that. So I was a stud finder, but what I was doing was I was just banging my head against the wall until I hit a stud and the stud knocked me out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, shoot. And so there's so many people times in business, dude, the owners just banging their head against the walls, being stud finders. What they really need to be doing is taking a step back and saying, Hey, who can help me solve this problem? Like who can help me get there? And I'll add one piece onto this and I'll hand it back to you, man, was, uh, I was in that place for so long and I was so far in the weeds of my own business and all of the problems and issues and cash flow issues and everything in my business that I walked into the house one day and I fall flat on my face and I black out. I wake up a few moments later and I can't really feel my hands. And I thought I was having a heart attack and I black out again. I wake up one more time on the gurney, getting rushed into the ambulance and one more time in the hospital over the next 24, 36 hours, however long I was in there. And that's all I remember. And the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And they, they basically diagnosed that I had a full blown panic attack. And it was my ego holding me down, not allowing me to ask for help. Right. As entrepreneurs, man, we stretch ourselves so thin, especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes there's no choice, right? If you don't have funding, what are you going to do? Like mm -hmm. hire a, mm -hmm. a CFO and a, a CMO? Right. Like the, uh, with the, money you don't have? With money you don't have. So yeah. in, in order to kind of get off the ground and build mm -hmm. something, it doesn't have to be perfect yet. You kind of have to do a little bit of everything. You have to sell, mm -hmm. you have to market, you have to operate, you have to make sure your finances are in check. And that can get overwhelming, especially because... We're not good at all of those things. None of us excel in all of those areas. I fucking love marketing. I love creative. I love business development. Mm -hmm. I hate spreadsheets. I hate numbers. <laughs> I hate HR. I hate legal. And I'll do it. Like when I was first starting off, you don't have a choice. You have to, you have you have, you have to do it. Right. But you, you keep going like that for long enough. You keep working the weekends. You keep trying to go through these spreadsheets and hammer out things that are just monotonous and tedious for you. It drains your soul over yeah. time. So the goal, I think for entrepreneurs starting out is grow yourself, grow your company to a point, suffer through it, grind through it. It sucks until it you can hire help around you. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, a thousand percent. And I would even say before you hire the help, the best place you can invest any extra money is in yourself, man. Like I invested, uh, I was, one of my goals for the last five years was to invest into this specific mastermind that we have just recently had the ability to invest into and, and have the qualifications to get in the room. And we're in the room and we're having conversations and, and I'm nowhere near these numbers. Like these aren't numbers I have on a daily basis. This is why it stretches me. Like they're talking about doing millions a month and tens of millions a month and hundreds of millions a year. And I'm like, this is a wild room. Right. Like I'm a, like, Putting myself in that room will make me more money than hiring somebody right now, right? And so you got to evaluate too, is like, where am I? Like, where do I need to get better? Like you said, you love marketing. Like getting better at marketing was probably better than hiring somebody in finances. 100%. And then you hire someone in finances to take on all the work that you just, you just went and sold. <laughs> Investing in yourself is an interesting subject. And I agree with you. One of the best things that I ever did was start to get involved in marketing conferences. And I imagine... Uh, from you saying you were in, in, in Boise, was this the funnel hacking? Are you in one of the inner circle groups? Yeah. 
And yep. it, it is so powerful for the reason that you just said. You probably thought you were hot shit before entering that group, making a ton <laughs> of money, doing small way better. Fry. Yeah, no. small, right. And it's a yeah. crazy sensation to look at the people you went to high school with, look at the people in your city and say, damn, I'm on another level. Yep. And then you fly out and you sit in a room with guys that are doing 10x, sometimes 100x what you are. And it's humbling. And it gives you kind of the motivation mm -hmm. and... I guess, reality check to, to push harder and to catch up. We're competitive creatures. At least I am, the most entrepreneurs that I know. And Oh, yeah, dude. I want to win. Right. That's it. I want to win. I want to go. And then you get in a room and you're like, wait a minute. I'm a loser. <laughs> this room makes me feel tiny. Right. That feeling is and, worth all of the money that you paid. That feeling is so and hard it's to funny. get anywhere else. You pay it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. When I lost the business, I paid it. Mm-hmm. And it felt like dog shit because I wasn't willing to get in the rooms and ask for the help. I thought I knew it. Yeah. But now that I pay to get into the room and I realize I'm not big. And for, for me, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially the men, like dude, ego is a driving force for a lot of us. Yeah. Like I just said, I want to win. That doesn't come from my, uh, my feminine side. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I want to win. That comes from like, like just ego. And it's the one thing that will kill the entrepreneur the fastest. It will choke the life out of you once you get to a certain level. And so that that's the biggest thing, man. I, I don't know if we even meant to go down the ego path, but that was, you're going to pay it either way. I agree. And I love the ego path because it's so relevant to the mindset of an entrepreneur and what like the catalyst is to our success. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a room full of guys doing $10 million, $100 million a year, I refuse to be the the smallest guy in that room come that meeting next year. I right. refuse. Right. Uh, do you feel like through these conferences, through these get togethers that you've learned a lot of important tactical information or mostly through most, mostly your growth has been through the networking and through what we just described? Yes, <laughs> is my answer. So um, the first time I ever invested in myself, I was 18 years old. I was doing roofing and I was driving a F-150 that was missing half of the steering wheel with a tailgate made out of a pegboard and I had full of roofing material in the back and this dumpy little truck. And I'm driving and I see this billboard and it says, if you didn't make 10K last month, call me. Dude, I busted out my phone. I make the phone call. I call the guy. I get a call three days later from this guy, Randall. And Randall and I are still friends to this day. And he recruited me into this like network marketing-ish, real estate investment education-ish thing. And it was the first time I'd ever invested in myself. And at the time it was all the money in the world. It was like 1500 bucks. And um, that was, but when I walked into that room and I realized, holy cow, the world I grew up in and the world these people live in are different. I am missing something. And that's when I began on that journey of like, how do I find out what I'm missing? Cause they've done it. They put their pants on the same way I do. I've got to be able to figure this out. It doesn't matter. I grew up poor. I've got to be able to figure this out. And um, so I would say to answer your question, I would say the tactics more came from doing the stuff that the conferences gave me the belief to do. Right. And failing at it and then asking for help. But it all started like the biggest battle we fight is these six inches, man. The six inches between our ears, the biggest battle we fight. And for me, I know that's always my biggest battle. And so I go to these conferences and I invest in these groups to help me see what's actually possible. So I can go touch it and point at it and be like, he's doing it. I can too. 100%. It kind of, one of my favorite comparisons of all time, I can't remember the name of the guy who finally like beat the four minute mile record, but that mm -hmm. same year, like six other people beat it. And it's kind of yep. the same principle to being in these rooms. Like our mm -hmm. limiting belief is that we can't yep. break $10 million a year, $100 million right. a year. And the only way to break that belief is to watch people around you doing it. How do you get around people doing it? Pay for these masterminds, man. It's so, yeah, the, the more successful you get, the more elusive groups get, the more elusive people get. Mm -hmm. And you better believe they're not going to be sitting around your city, walking around, hanging out at the coffee shop, ready to hang out with you. They're, mm -hmm. they're fucking busy. Yeah. Where, you, where you can find them and socialize with them is you, you, you pay to be in the room. It's a, it, it's the, it's the bottleneck. It's the, it's the way to get in. It, it really is. I was actually just telling a friend this the other day. I was like, I've always had the opportunity to pay to be in the room. 
And here is the difference between, and I know what a lot of people are saying, well, I didn't have the money to be in the room. I didn't either. Yeah. Every time I've ever invested to be in a room or to a mastermind, I didn't have the money. And that's kind of the point. <laughs> and so, um, do we, I don't know how long we're going here, man. I was going to share a quick little story about resourcefulness if we have the time. Go for it. Yeah. 10, 20 more minutes. Dude. So there was a, there was a time where, um, I had a business partnership go south and, uh, I was trying to figure out how to make some stuff work. I just couldn't crack the code. And um, I get on a call with this guy. And it was like one of the uh, a few years back. I get on a call. And he's like, hey, to work with us, it's 10K. And you got to you, you pay it in two payments. And the time for me, I was like, dude, there's no way. $10,000? Like, I can't pay you 10 grand right now. I just lost. I'm, I'm just, like, there's no way. He's like, well, okay, man. Take, like, and he challenged me on some stuff. And I told him, but I got to the end of that phone call. And I wasn't like that. I got to the end of the phone call because I knew I needed it. I said, hey, man, give me two weeks. I'll find the money. There, there, there's a... there he goes. Cool. So I said, give me two weeks and I'll find the money. And uh, I went on Craigslist and I found somebody that would let me re remodel their bathroom. So I went and remodeled their bathroom, made 10K, paid this off. Two weeks later, made $21,000 from what they taught me to do. And um, so there's two types of people, those who have resources and those who, have res who, who are resourceful. And the cool thing is, is you get to choose which one you want to be. If you don't have resources, you have one option, and that's being resourceful. So if you're afraid of paying to get in the rooms, you can't afford to get into the rooms, be resourceful, because I promise you getting in the rooms will literally be the thing that changes your, like, the trajectory of your future. One, I guess, counter argument I've heard to joining these masterminds is that they pay all this money, and it's not quite what they expected. You didn't get to meet Russell. Mm -hmm. You didn't get any time with Russell. You didn't learn any tactical information. Uh, and I'm a strong believer in you get out what you put in, right? If you show up to these things and you're like, well, Russell's not here. I didn't learn anything new. I already knew that. And you're going to kind of leave with a bad experience, a sour taste mm -hmm. in your mouth. You might not get the feeling, the motivation, the inspiration, and the network to actually go and, and implement what you're, what you're learning, what you're thinking, what you're building. Uh, is there any tactics or advice that you can give to help people who are ready to invest in themselves and join these masterminds and conferences, get the most out of them? Yeah, thousand percent. The first thing is expectations, right? So for me, when I go into these rooms, for me, a mastermind is the collective of the group. It's not the leader of the group. And so even the leader of the group should be getting some things from the collective of the group or somebody's lying somewhere. <laughs> like Russell would even get on stage and like, He'd ask, and like somebody in the audience could solve it. And it was just a really cool thing to witness. Um, and so I would say the best things that you can do to get out of is be a good student. Like if you don't leave these things with pages and pages of notes of things that you already know, you're doing it wrong because we need to be reminded way more than we know. And so the first thing is just fervorously take notes the entire time. Like every, everything anybody's saying, just take notes, like be a good student is the first thing. Um, but the next thing is network with people around you and don't be afraid. Like even for me, man, I have a hard time. Like if there's a group of people talking, I struggle walking up and like starting the conversation with them sometimes, you know, like we're on a computer screen. Like I don't interact with people five days out of the week. Like, um, and so I had to get over some insecurities the first day I'm kind of staring around. Like I, 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 I don't know what to do. And I had some fear and insecurity even first day in the room, but it was like, just go up and start having conversations. Like be genuinely interested, interested in someone else. Like give someone a genuine compliment and then strike up a conversation. And, um, you know, don't be boring. Like have some stuff to say, have some questions to ask. Like I have this, uh, this silly game called Answer the Internet and it has all these weird questions. Like if you were to sneeze, would you rather have this happen or this happen? And they're just fun icebreakers. Like have some of those things and spend 10 minutes investing in how to network. Like that's all you need. And then go network. And then if somebody asks you to do something or you make a connection and you say you're going to reach out, do it. Like be a man of your word. Say what you're going to like, do what you're going to say. So, no, say what, do what you say you're going to do and just follow through and be like a decent human being. And then the final thing is the most important is it's be a giver, not a taker. Give way, 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 way more. But you're like, but I paid to be there. Yes. So did everybody else in the room. So give way, way more than you take. 
I'm with you. And one of the secrets to Hermosi's success, uh, and he talks about this in a lot of his podcasts, is he used to do all of these masterminds. And when he would join them, he would just get in there and give as much value to as many people as possible. And mm -hmm. that's kind of philosophy that I've uh, absorbed over the past couple of years. I've been a, a part of a couple of masterminds. A lot of the ones, I'm one of the, the more successful characters in the group. And the first thing that I do is come in and I say, listen, if anyone wants to spend 15, 20 minutes ask me questions, learn a tactic, learn a strategy. Just here, here's my calendar link, hop on. Yep. And that has been monumental for me. The people who have I've gotten on the phone with have grown and they've supported me in every new thing that I've launched. Mm -hmm. And it's, it feels really good. And that's how you build a, a, a strong network. That's how you get people listening to your podcast consistently, sharing your videos and your tweets. Uh, so that's one piece of advice that I have is get in there, especially yeah. if you're one of the more farther along guys in your group or, or, or ladies in your group, get in there and give value. And one easy way to do it is say, hey, here I am. Here's my wheelhouse of, of stuff that I can give back. If you want any time with me at all, you know, here, here's my calendar link, mm -hmm. get on there. And it, 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 it's paid back in dividends. Thousand percent. And we're moving into a world, man, where marketing is gonna, or business is gonna be way more relational than it's gonna be transactional. I feel like for the last, a few years at least, everything's been very transactional in business. And we're definitely moving into a place where people do business with people they actually like, right. and that's why they do business with them. And you're going to see people doing, not doing business with people they don't like, and it's going to become even more important and critical to build relationships with your customers, to build relationships with people around you. It's like just the, the age old thing. Like we're, we want to be social on social media, like be social in real life and with other people too. Couldn't agree with you more. And a, a big other development that we're seeing kind of in business is the massive emergence of like the coaching industry. Yeah. I have a coach. Um, I've been a coach. I've had multiple coaches over the course of my career. I like to think that you, it, it's a good idea to change your coach as you, your, your, your mm -hmm. season changes, as your level changes to find someone who's appropriate and teaching that, that subject matter. Mm -hmm. But it's just such a dominant industry. Everyone's got a course that most and I don't say that as a bad thing. I've consumed so many courses. It mm -hmm. is the, I, I studied medicine through college, through medical oh, really? school. Yeah, I graduated medical school four years ago. I had nothing to do with marketing. And I found an interest in it. I must have devoured 500 courses on different subjects within digital marketing, practiced them, perfected them, worked with mentors to, to fine tune stuff. But with this emerging industry, I mean, where do you see this going? I know you work with a lot of coaches now. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the coaching industry. Well, I think, I think there's going to be two things that happen over the next season. I think we can all agree there are signs that something is percolating in the economy, whether you want to call it a recession, a downturn, or whatever you want to call it, something is happening. And so um, I think a couple of things are going to happen. One is it's really going to separate the charlatans from the experts. The people who don't really know what they're doing from those that do, because the people they're working with, their businesses aren't on an up, 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 up. When everything's on a down, 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 you start to see who, the people who actually know what they're talking about. Because like Hormozy talks about, like it's hard to beat a market, whether the market's good or bad. So if the market's good, it's really easy to be a coach. It's really easy to fix business problems. It's really easy to do marketing. But when the market starts going down is when you start really seeing like, oh, this person actually knows what they're talking about. Um, and what that's going to do is I think there's going to be a, um, a, a lot of people getting out of the space or a lot of those coaches kind of going away or shutting down. And, um, this kind of happened similar in 2008, if you follow that, that, that curve as well. And so what it's going to do is it's going to orphan a lot of people like you and me who enjoy working with coaches into the market who don't have a coach or anything that they're looking for. The person that they did look up to is no longer there. And it's going to leave a lot of people in the space looking for somewhere to plug in their umbilical cord to and start getting fed from and start getting that stuff from. And so for the experts out there and for those of you that are listening, like get really, really, really good at your craft. And if you're not an expert, become an expert because over the next, let's call it four years, you will be able to get significantly more market share than you have been able to over the last four years. So I think it's a massive opportunity, but only for those that are prepared. What is the best way for experts to, I guess, develop that expertise, showcase it and turn it into a business? Like, what do you, what do you see? So I think there's been a weird thing in the expert space happening where 
people get into, hey, I want to be, I want to be a coach or consultant. So I go read a book on marketing and then they go try coaching people on marketing. I think the real experts in getting better is like, go do marketing for yourself and learn how to get good at marketing. And once you get good at that and you are the expert at that, then go do it for someone else. Um, but to, it really comes from experience. And if you, uh, maybe you are working with people early on and you're just getting into this space and you have some success for yourself and now you're trying to recreate it somewhere else, like make an agreement with yourself. I'm never in favor of doing anything for free ever, but make an agreement with yourself that if you don't get them the results that you're going to, that you've promised, give them a refund. And it's going to actually make you question whether or not you should take on these clients. And there's nothing worse to me than somebody knowing they can't get someone results, taking the client on, not getting the results and not giving a refund. Like, dude, that's thievery. <laughs> you can't do that. Um, and so work with people. And as you're working with them, demonstrate proper expertise, do the things, make the mistakes with clients, make them right. And then if you don't get them the results, know that you have the agreement with yourself that you're going to refund them. I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's like, go do the things, but just do it with ethics. I think that's a great way to, to gain expertise, get practice. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm with you. That's a similar model that we used in our service. Started nice. off real cheap, uh, mostly practice, practicing the craft, getting better. Uh, and then over time, kind of raising our prices. But of course, if we were unable to, to follow through for somebody, and you do this not only because it's the right thing to do, but early on, one bad review, one angry customer can destroy you. And it is a much smarter business decision to give them their money back than to fight it because yeah. you want to protect your company. It's not worth the dollars and cents. No. It's the, it's the morally right thing to do. And it's the right business thing to do. Thousand percent, man. Thousand percent. As a coach, uh, and you coach coaches now, as, as, uh, yeah. if I'm correct, what is the, the value ladder that you're seeing work? What are coaches, uh, selling? Uh, and do you think that that landscape is going to change over the next five to 10 years? I, I absolutely think, I think it's already changing. Um, you know, typically you had, you know, a low end product and you ran them up the value ladder to a higher end and then a more expensive one and then a more expensive. And that was just kind of the model. And eventually they got to a place where they hit the top of your value ladder. And it's like, they're at the peak of your organization. I think one of the biggest things that's shifting in the marketplace right now is desire for continuity. I know in my business, um, I had a, I had a, um, earth shattering mental moment a few months back. Um, everything in my business is episodic. We bring on clients and we work on with clients and but like every month or every day we start over we have leads that come in, we close the leads, we work with the leads, we, they move on and they might ascend into something else that we have, but like it's a hundred percent episodic. And I was listening to something from the legend, Dan Kennedy, right? He's big, coming, becoming big in the, in the world again. And he said, if you have an episodic business, you don't have a business. You have an episode of, of income stream. And I'm seeing a lot of people right now really focusing on getting continuity in their business. That's one thing that we're building out right now. We're building out a crazy Rolodex for, for visionaries. But um, the, the reoccurring model, I think, is something that a lot of people are going to be starting gravitating towards. Like, hey, let me work with you on a reoccurring basis and see if I get results for really, really low risk. Let me get access to your stuff and, and you help me out in a way for a little, really low risk. Or let me just come get content from you at a li really low risk. And if I know you, like you, trust you, have that relationship with you, then they'll ascend into the higher ticket. But I think, you know, for the longest times they were going, you know, add to call booking funnel, call booking funnel to sales team, sales team closes it and they move on. It's like, that's the first interaction with you. I think that's going to get tremendously expensive, if not impossible to do over the next few years. And you need some type of something on the back end, one to actually have a business. Um, so you have some continuity and you have something coming in, but just the, the, the market's just shifting. I think they're just having those buyer walls up and people have been getting burned by the charlatans out there. And I think that's one thing that people are going to start to realize. It's like, ah, let me, let me, let me slow play this a little bit more. Right. And I, I'm watching this kind of ideas going viral, business ideas, offer ideas. Everybody seems to be doing similar things. Everybody read yep. Hermosi's hundred million dollar offers book. Everybody's trying to be, you know, the, <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I've yep. got the audio book primarily, but it's the same idea. Everybody's doing it. They're, they're value stacking. They're, mm -hmm. they're doing really, really high ticket. Everybody's consuming the same content, watching the same stuff. And <laughs> that's because, <laughs> sorry, you're good, dude. And that's because it works for a lot of people, uh, especially mm -hmm. coaches and the value mm -hmm. ladder works. They're seeing all the masterminds, mm -hmm. all the courses, mm -hmm. all the coaching programs, this stuff works. But like you said, if you're not 
top of your class. And if you don't have a back end monthly or a recurring model, uh, mm -hmm. I think you're going to be in danger because this Agreed. The high ticket offer, try and get the close. It's, it's getting overplayed. Uh, I completely yep. agree with you. Yeah, man. hundred percent. All right. So let's, uh, let's wrap up here. I'd love to hear some final bits of advice for entrepreneurs listening to this, specifically those that are interested in coaching, because mm -hmm. that is your wheelhouse. What should they be focusing on over the next five to 10 years to excel in the coaching space? Man, I, I'm going to speak to, because mo most of the people, let me know if you agree with this, actually, like, you know, your audience better than I do. Do, do you think most of the people li listening are like the visionary minded, or do you think they're more like the integrator tactical? Let me do the things minded. My guess is that most of our listeners are visionaries. Um, okay. I think most entrepreneurs have to have at least a little bit of visionary in them. Yep. Uh, and I, if you're listening to this, I promise you, you do. You have visionary in you. Uh, and you can make it. All right, let's, uh, let's get into some advice. So I would say for the, for the visionaries listening, um, the, the biggest thing is going to be getting people to execute on your ideas and understanding that your brain is the value, not your fingers. And so you're going to be able to grow faster if you get someone to take your ideas and execute them for you. Like we call them an integrator or an operator or a COO, like whatever you want to call it, getting them to actually do the thing that you want them to do. A second command is the best thing that you can have in a business. You need someone to see down into the future and you need someone to active and activate in the present. And it's very hard to do with the same type of personality. So the first thing is like, even if it's an executive assistant, if that's your first hire, like get someone to do the tactics, but then always keep investing into your brain because you are the visionary and the brain is the powerful machine that, that, that shows you into the future and whatever you're trying to build and look at. So I would say the biggest piece of advice is don't try and do it by yourself. Get someone that you can put your ideas on that they can actually go and execute on as fast as you want them to. I love both of those pieces of advice. Uh, if you're, if you're listening to this, be a good student, take notes. That's, that's gold right there. Uh, and Kyle, this is mentors collective. I always ask the same questions at the end of this. Is there any, a single guru expert that you've followed who has helped you through your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, ideally somebody that people know, uh, or can actually go look up and watch their content. I would say Taylor Welch, hands down. Taylor Welch, hands down, has been the biggest impact. Um, again, primarily from that belief side of things. So go check him out. Taylor Welch, he's, he's a rock star, man. I haven't heard that one yet, so I'm going to go check him out myself. Yeah. And then last question, a single book that's been inspirational to you that's kind of changed your trajectory yep. as an entrepreneur. Uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. My number one, always recommended... Now, Out in the Double by Napoleon Hill. You know, that's one Russell talks about over and over again. I've never actually picked it up. You might be the final cal catalyst to make me go pick up that pick up that book. <laughs> uh, thank well, you, brother. If you're an audiobook guy, I'll, I'll send you a copy when we get off. If you have it on audiobook, please yep. send it over. That would be yep. I'll send be it huge. over, man. It's, uh, it's an incredible, incredible read. Thank you, Kyle. And for those listening that liked what you had to say, want to hear more of you, follow you on social, where is the best place to do that? Uh, YouTube, Seven Figure Kyle, or if you search Kyle Livingston, uh, follow me on YouTube. That'd probably be the best place to catch me. Cool, Kyle. It's a blast jamming with you. Um, Thanks, Looking Jay. forward to having you in my inner circle and continuing the conversation. Thank you, brother. Cool. Thanks, brother. See you.